Hello people of the internet, welcome to episode 20 of Paint to Life, the YouTube channel where we take tiny plastic miniatures, throw some acrylic paint on them, and breathe life into them with storytelling so that you might learn something new on the subject or take it to use as your own in your own campaign. How do you stop a rampaging red dragon? Watch tonight's story to find out. If this is your first time here, welcome. If you like my content and storytelling, please like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Also know that the painting video that I paint that runs up there in the corner will be released on Tuesday on the channel as well, so if you want to paint along, it runs with my commentary and little tidbits and whatnot. And finally, I'll be revealing the surprise I've been teasing for the last couple episodes at the end of tonight's episode, so make sure you watch right through the end of the video. Enough yap. I'm GMA Tank. Let's get painting. Alright, last week we painted a Kings of War miniature, it was a Basilian Phoenix, and we learned the story of Solaris. If you missed that episode, I strongly suggest you check it out as it was Litsif. Litsif? Lit as F? Whatever that means. Now I want you to think of a dragon, right now. Close your mind. Think of a dragon. Now stop. What was the first image that came into your mind? 3% of you saw this, 17% of you saw this, 20% of you saw this, 1% of you saw this, you healthy nuts, and the remaining 69% of you saw this. Of the evil chromatic dragons, the largest, most formidable, and most terrible is the red dragon. Couple side notes, 87% um, of all statistics are completely made up and I'm terrible at math. Rapacious, ferocious, vengeful, avaricious, scholars regard red dragons as the most archetypical evil dragons. They are obsessive treasure collectors. They covet absolutely anything of monetary value and tirelessly seek to increase the size of their hordes. Also, they can judge the smallest baubles worth at a mere glance. Woe be to he or she who steals from a red. They will tirelessly trace and track to recover the theft, or at the very least, personally bring their entire power down upon the thief and anyone who gave them aid or shelter. Now in the event they can't find that thief, red dragons will go into an, an enraged state and go on a destructive rampage to all living creatures in the vicinity to ensure that news of the theft goes unnoticed in the wake of their destruction. And there's a reason for that, we'll get to that in a bit. They're voracious meat eaters and love to keep armies of thralls and servants to serve them, pay them tribute, feed them, and also spy for them. You see, red dragons don't care much about their chromatic cousins, but they have a keen interest in the notoriety of every other red dragon near its territory. Reds are extremely vain, so they're always keeping like tabs and a checklist of who's doing well, who's the largest treasure hoard, who caused the most damage on their last rampage. It's kind of a thing for them. Confident fighters, retreat is no option for them, for fear of losing status amongst the other red dragons. If a red dragon loses reputation, it can sometimes enrage and go into a fit of destruction where it tries to regain some of that lost status and typically does, kind of what I mentioned earlier with regards to chasing down the thief that stole from them. Now despite having an intense fire breath that is like their hallmark, it is so destructive that most reds will prefer to fight tooth and claw on the ground rather than risk using it and destroying any potential loot that their felled enemies might have on them. Now. My advice for any of you players out there who might encounter a red dragon while playing D&D. Simple. Step one, roll initiative. Step two, get <laughs> But who is our red dragon? Ruthos the Red had just returned to his lair in the Andals Mountains to find it had been plundered. A little bit of investigation and he found the culprits. Um, Oxborn Estate, Malark Oxborn. He was actually home when the dragon descended from the sky using its giant mass to crash into the house, killing uh, Malark. He then had Malark's 12 year old son crawl and sift through the rubble of his home, finding every single piece of the stolen treasure before he then immolated the boy. 
Now, Taryn Lawson was the second culprit. He was a fat wizard of some renown. And he was at his parents' house using the outhouse, literally pants around his ankles, when the dragon stealthily approached. Luckily for Taryn, his familiar started shrieking, Dragon! 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 Which alerted the mage, who gave him the chance to teleport away, leaving his pants behind. However, having missed his quarry and the opportunity for vengeance, Ruthos enraged and destroyed his parents' house, his parents, and the entire village and began to harass the countryside as a result. Now the king was made aware of the current situation, but unfortunately they were currently at war with another country and most of his military was on assignment. Luckily, their salvation came not too long after. A wealthy foreign noble arrived with a complement of approximately 25 soldiers and at least as many servants. The man met with the king and the castle herald announced him as Lord Baelish. No relation. I am a man of extreme talent and wealth, and I hear you have a dragon problem. And I am a dragon solution, provided you have adequate coin. The man was in his early 30s and had a muscular build. He was wearing foreign leather armor, a silver halberd, a gold bound spell book, and a brilliant red cloak that appeared to be made of dragon scales. Now the king was in doubt. Money can't stop a dragon, he said. Our kingdom has more wealth than all the surrounding countries combined, and what good does it do me hidden away in extra-dimensional vaults? Let us sup together. I will tell you of my exploits, and I guarantee you'll hire me and my Praetorian guards. Now they have dinner together, and Baelish tells the king all kinds of stories of all different types of dragons and how he's taken all of them down using their own avarice against them. The king says he'll think about it and give his answer in the morning. The next day, word reaches the castle that Ruthos has destroyed another village, and the situation is becoming dire as word is beginning to reach the armies abroad and demoralizing the troops who want to come home to defend their families and their homes. Baelish again tells the king he needs his Praetorian guards and his abilities to take down this dragon. And finally, the king takes him up on the offer. Now listen, you need to get your reserve troops to the field south of the castle. The king laments that while his reserve army is the finest in the land, he doesn't believe that the dragon will engage them in open combat on the field. That's because these magnificent creatures aren't stupid, your majesty. If I release a rumor that Cuprum the trickster is among the army, the red will come. If your army fails to take him down, allow me a chance to show you what your money can do. The king, while confused, agrees. Lord Baelish spends his afternoon sitting high atop a tower overlooking the courtyard of the castle while his men erect a large gong. Now the next day around noon, Ruthos does indeed arrive and engages the king's men in the open field. While the soldiers successfully harry the dragon, they begin to falter and scatter, retreating in panic. Ring the gong, says Lord Baelish. Your majesty, Order your treasure be brought to the courtyard quickly. Meanwhile, Ruthos has killed many soldiers, eaten many villagers, destroyed many towns, and he's finally sated in his desire to regain his lost honor having been robbed. He takes to the sky and begins to fly back towards his lair in the Andals Mountains, when suddenly he hears a loud gong sound emitting from the castle. The dragon changes its course and does a flyby over the castle. It observes a massive pile of gold, 345,240 to be precise, give or take. Despite the many guards visible on the ramparts, he dares not use his breath and risk destroying the treasure, so instead, he will crash into the ground and the shockwaves will destroy the fortification and send many of the men flying to their deaths. And like that, Ruthos lands like a meteor, fire trailing from his nose, slamming his immense weight into the courtyard stones, only for the stones to sink, breaking apart into a thick, viscous mud, in which he sinks face first, more than halfway up his body. From under the balcony, Lord Baelish steps forward with his hand raised. As Ruthos struggles to pull his head and body out of the mud, his neck cocked awkwardly, eyes and ears freed, but John Melth still submerged under the mud. Baelish's fingers snap, and instantly the mud reforms into solid stone. Futilely struggling with all of his strength, the wounded, exhausted dragon Ruthos is entombed and now suffocating. The king, the king's guard, and all the citizens present let out a great cheer. 
You are our savior, they exclaim. All hail Lord Baelish. The king even bows his head in appreciation. Actually, it's pronounced Baelic. Ruthos, you pathetic excuse for a worm. The red's wide eyes tremble anxiously. And I didn't even need to transform. With a flash, Balak's arms swing over his head in a fluid motion, his halberd decapitating the battling monarch. As if in sync, every single one of his Praetorian guards begins attacking and murdering the king's guards who are too shocked to react. Balak's eyes take on a red glow, and large reptilian scales begin to appear in his skin. Keep the women to tempt back the army. Keep the youths for me, he says as he licks his lips. Now, I want every one of those 345,240 gold pieces picked up and accounted for. He then transforms into a massive red dragon encompassing the entire courtyard, even larger than Ruthos, with golden yellow wings singed black at the bottom and eyes that glow like molten lava. Balrek the Red and his human form. Alright, so, what did you think of tonight's episode? Here is Balak for the shelf. Alright, now for the surprise that I've been promising. Now that I've painted all five chromatic dragons and all five metallic dragons, I think I want to paint their relevant gods. Now, next week, I'll be painting Bahamut, the lawful good god of the metallic dragons. The week after that, I'll be painting Tiamat, the lawful evil goddess of the chromatic dragons. Now, here are the minis that I plan to do for those. These are called Icons of the Realms. They're pre-painted from the factory, and they're pretty rare these days. I think I would like to paint them myself in the style of their children. Uh, so I'm going to be washing them both, priming them, painting over them a la paint to life, which means there are going to be two stories of conflict that include all ten of the dragons we've seen so far in paint to life. So it's kind of an ambitious play. I'm, to be honest, super excited and nervous at the same time, but time to get started. So with that said, go down to your friendly local gaming store and get started. I'm in a lot of forums, I'm in a lot of chats, a lot of groups, and I see all kinds of people, but I don't know how to do it, I don't even know where to start. I'm telling you where to start. Go, tell them GMA Tank sent you. Pick up some stuff, give it a try. Might be your new hobby. You might be making a YouTube channel before you know it. Remember guys, I release story videos every Saturday and the subsequent painting videos get released on the Tuesday afterwards with my commentary. So if you wanna paint along, you can do so and maybe I can give you some tips and tricks or maybe you can just laugh at me speaking candidly without script because that's what I typically do. It's like a, a live stream without the time commitment. Head on over to painttolife.com, check out the website, all the episodes are there, as well as my Instagram, Work in Progress Wednesday, uh, which is a good little place to see what I'm working on in the middle of the week if you're interested in such things, blog posts that I update every once in a while, uh, and you know, it's just kind of fun, so give it a check out if you'd like. That's all I have for now. I'm GMA Tank, we'll see you next week, wash your hands people. Don't tell my wife, but I could probably sell these on eBay for 150 bucks each, but we're going to paint them.